Dead America, the Second Month, Atticus on the Rails, Part 5. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter 1 Just outside of the town of Loomis, Atticus, Madison, and Julius sat in their SUV. The moonlight illuminated the small town, dozens of zombies milling about that were within sight. Madison stood just outside of the vehicle, standing at the front of it, talking on the walkie-talkie to Max about the new plan. You would have thought they would have cleared out the town, given how close it is to one of their bases, Atticus mused. Julia shrugged, shaking his head. Tactical move on their part, he said. The ex-ranger cocked a brow. Tactical move? he asked. How so? Those boys have a lot going on, Julius continued, holding up fingers on his hand as he spoke. Strengthening their position, fighting with us, and setting up for the long-term logistical things like a sustainable food supply that will keep them going past this winter. By trapping those things in the only town for quite a while, it prevents us from having a foothold to launch an attack from. Atticus chuckled under his breath. Yet, here we are, about to launch an attack on them, he pointed out. I suppose a suicide run counts as an attack, Julius quipped. The ex-ranger glanced over at him, finding a sly grin on his partner's face, causing him to let out another chuckle. He smirked, shaking his head. That's a good one, he commended. Just wouldn't let Madison hear you say that. Julius shrugged. She'd probably get a laugh out of it too, he said. But if she doesn't, I got ten bucks on her when she comes after you, Atticus said, pointing a finger. I'll take twenty on her, the other man agreed. The ex-ranger barked a laugh. Betting on yourself to lose? he asked. I've taken beatings for less, Julius admitted. Atticus cocked an interested brow. So, you weren't making bank at the strip club? he asked. The other man shook his head and sighed. I know it may come as a shock, he said. But the owner of a BYOB strip club wasn't the most reliable person when it came to delivering paychecks on time. And you stayed at this job? The ex-ranger asked, blinking at him in shock. I like titties, Julius said simply. Most nights I'd even get paid to look at them. Atticus burst out laughing again, shaking his head. Hard to argue with that, he agreed. You must have a silver tongue if you were able to convince your landlord to let you be laid on the rent every month. The other man snorted. Boss was the landlord too, he said. First of the month would come around, he'd get mad, we didn't have the rent, and I'd have to tell him this sob story about this horrible boss who didn't pay on time. Finally, it'd click in his mind. He'd crack up, toss us a bottle of cheap whiskey, and say the first lap dance was on him that night. As long as he was paying and not performing, Atticus said. Julius shuddered visibly. Of all the horrible things I've seen in recent weeks, he drawled. That one just took first place. The ex-ranger grinned. You're welcome, he said brightly. They shared a laugh as Madison got back into the SUV, and she glanced between the two jovial men with raised eyebrows. What did I miss? she asked. Just reminiscing about bad bosses, Atticus replied. She sighed. It's a shame we don't have a few hours, because I have some whoppers to tell, she said wistfully. But we're on the clock. What did Max say? Atticus asked. Madison tilted her head back and forth. He's less enthusiastic about breaking into Holdridge, especially with the group he has, she admitted. So we're going to have to pull out all the stops. You got a plan? Atticus asked. She took a deep breath. Kind of, she admitted. Well, fragments of one. Fragments of a couple, actually. So if you cram all those together, it's sort of like a plan. He stared down his nose at her. That was less than convincing, he said dryly. Yeah, I know, she huffed. Well, talk it out, he said, motioning for her to speak. What do you have? Madison nodded, leaning back in her seat. We can do a bombing run, she began. Really get their attention. Sounds a little extreme. 
Atticus mused. Plus, we don't have any explosives. Unless you're holding out on me. Would it work, though? Julius piped up, leaning forward. I mean, where would we even hit? There's a massive car dealership on the west side of town, right on the highway, Madison explained, waving a hand in the vague general direction. They used some of the vehicles in the lot to barricade the town, but there's still a significant number of them in the lot. Julius cocked a brow. And you know this how? he asked. My informant was kind enough to suggest some weak spots at various strongholds, she replied, her voice a bit clipped. Ah, yes, the magical informant, Julius scoffed. Have you verified any of this information? She rubbed her temples. Not this again, she groaned. I will tell you what I told the mayor, that it's none of your concern. The mayor is curled up under a blanket, sleeping the night away, he shot back and pointed a finger at his own chest. I'm out here about to run straight into a military strength buzzsaw. I assure you that it is very much my concern. Atticus took a deep breath. He's right, he said slowly. You don't have to give up your source, but knowing he's legit would go a long way towards easing some fears. She exhaled loudly enough for all of them to hear, her frustration not quite boiling over. She managed to keep it quelled, finally nodding in agreement. Okay, she finally said, crossing her arms. You're not getting my source. However, you remember that convoy we hit outside of Harper's farm last week? Julius nodded. Yeah, you said they were coming for the farm and we stopped them, he said. My source provided that information, she said, turning to face him with steel in her gaze. And you remember that massive cache of medicine we got from the Hayes Medical Center? He nodded, and it was clear on his face that he knew where this was going. Yeah, he said. The only reason we knew they were there was because of my source, she said, voice rising. Now, have I done a background check on him? Of course not. Those don't exactly exist anymore. Have I threatened him with every medieval torture technique in existence if I catch him lying to me? You bet I have. She jutted out her chin. Has his information saved countless lives on our side? Absolutely. Atticus glanced back at Julius, giving him a firm nod. Look, man, I know it's a tough ask. To put your life on the line based on information from someone you don't know. He began slowly, being as diplomatic as possible. But that's the job. That's what you're out here doing. I assume you volunteer to run missions like this because you want what's best for the other civilians back in town. Am I right? Yeah, you're right, the other man muttered. I'm a lot more capable than most of those folks. Gotta do my part. Well, right now your part is helping us go on a bombing run, Atticus declared, then shrugged. I mean... If it puts your mind at ease, I have a ride out of this situation and a comfy apartment waiting for me back in Seattle. Got power, a stack of DVDs, and home-cooked meals. But I still trust Madison. Julius gaped at him. Shit, man. If we survive this, can I hitch a ride back to town with you? He asked. Can't cook to save my life, but I can microwave the hell out of a burrito. They chuckled a bit the tension leaving the vehicle and bringing them back into work mode. Okay, Atticus said, looking to Madison. So, a bombing run. What are you thinking, taking out the cars? She nodded. I would be surprised if the cars still had any fuel in them, she admitted. However, they can still burn and cause a hell of a show. What are you thinking? Julius asked. Molotovs? The ex-ranger nodded thoughtfully. Cheap, dirty. But quite effective, he agreed. Problem is, we don't really have any at the moment. Madison pointed towards the nearby town of Loomis. Town full of raw materials just waiting to be looted, she said. So, fighting against ex-military guys isn't enough for you in one night? Julius asked dryly. Atticus held up a hand. They haven't looted the town? he asked, surprised. Not according to my source, Madison confirmed. Too small. Not worth the manpower or risk to get in there. So, we just need some glass bottles and something flammable, the ex-ranger said. Shouldn't be too hard. What makes you say that? 
Julius asked, cocking his head. Attica shrugged. Living in the middle of nowhere, you gotta figure there's at least a few drinkers in that town, he said. Going on a suicide run, and you want to waste liquor? Julius quipped, shaking his head. Have I mentioned how happy I am that you graced us with your presence, cowboy? Atticus chuckled. Let's get a move on, Madison said firmly. Max is prepping and wants to move in an hour. Wants as much darkness as he can get. Any intel on the town? The ex-ranger asked. She shook her head. Mostly residential, so we're going to be going house to house, she said. Better get to it then, Atticus said, and popped the SUV into gear, speeding towards the edge of town. It had been hastily fenced off with barbed wire, filling in the gaps between the fences at the houses. They parked at the edge, got out, and readied some melee weapons. There were dozens of zombies in view, spread out over several yards and stretching into the residential neighborhood on the other side of them. The group was still in the dark, and only a few of the creatures had noticed them. Okay, we divide and conquer in there, Atticus said. You want to split up? Julius asked. The ex-ranger held up a finger. Only when we get into a house, he clarified. Madison, you take the kitchens, look for glass and anything flammable. Julius, if there's a garage, you take it. Gas cans would be best, but kerosene will work too. And what are you going to do? Madison asked. I'm going to clear the house, Atticus replied. You clear the rooms you're in, I'll handle the rest. Might be worth checking the bedrooms, Julius suggested. Maybe get lucky with some ammo. We have plenty of bullets, Madison said. Not for us, for the Molotovs, he explained. Give them a little angry piñata action. Maybe make our numbers get bigger than they are. The other two exchanged a look and Atticus finally shrugged. Gonna have everybody shooting at us anyway, he drawled. What's a few more bullets flying towards us? Love me some chaos, Madison agreed. Let's go get it, boys. Chapter 2 The trio readied their blades as a few creatures pressed up against the chain-link fence, drawn to their conversation. The majority of the other ghouls hadn't paid them any attention, at least not yet. They each walked up to a creature and jammed their knives into their skulls with Julius grabbing his creature, pulling it towards him and delivering several vicious strikes to the forehead with his brass knuckles. It took a couple of punches, but its skull caved in. Follow my lead, Atticus said, and hopped over the fence, making a run for the back door of the first house. There were a few zombies in the backyard who headed their way when they noticed them from the noise. They were completely contained within the backyard fence, so there was no threat of others coming towards them. Atticus led with his knife, jamming it into the first creature and driving it backwards into the other trio. They fell to the ground in a heap as the others rushed towards the door. Madison tried the handle, but it was locked. Julius didn't miss a beat, stepping up and delivering a perfect punch with his brass knuckles. He hit the glass and immediately stopped his hand from going through, preventing any injury. He quickly reached in and unlocked the door just as Atticus got there. Let's knock this out, the ex-ranger said. Atticus threw open the door and bolted inside quickly scanning the dining room as they entered. They saw movement coming from the living room, immediately heading in that direction while the other two moved to their designated rooms. He stepped into the living room, seeing two creatures, what looked like an older couple covered in bite marks. He launched into his offensive, stabbing the little old lady in the head and tossing her frail corpse aside, before shoving the old man by the chest as he got a little too close. The creature fell onto the couch, and Atticus put it out of its misery with a strike to the head, before it could even begin to struggle to get up. He didn't waste time, darting down the hallway and checking each room as he went, relieved to see they were empty. Clear, he yelled. Clear, Madison called back from the kitchen. Atticus went into the master bedroom looking around at the typical older couple's style. There were plenty of photos of family and grandkids on the walls, some very dated decor, and a small bed. He walked over to the closet, throwing the door open and beginning to dig through it. 
He got frustrated when he didn't see anything that would show that the old man would have kept any weapons in the house. Figures, he muttered. He went back to the main portion of the house, moving like a man on a mission. He made it to the kitchen and spotted Madison standing there, arms folded and shaking her head. No luck, huh? Atticus asked. She sighed. Nope, she admitted. A couple of mason jars, but no lids. No alcohol either. Julius emerged from the garage, also empty-handed, at least for glass. He was carrying a large axe. Nothing on the list, but this might come in handy, he said. Next house? Madison asked, raising a hand. Next house, Atticus confirmed with a sharp nod. They walked over to the front yard, looking out and finding a throng of creatures outside. Dozens stretched out in their field of view, shambling around in various directions. I'm liking this plan less and less, Julius admitted. Then we don't go that way, Atticus said. Let's stay along this back row of houses. Most of the backyards are fenced in. Shouldn't be a big deal to move. Lead the way, Madison said, motioning with her hand. The ex-ranger led the group from the house, where the few zombies they'd left alive had finally gotten back to their feet. Julius walked over and swung his new shiny axe with as much force as he could muster. The blade was incredibly sharp, nearly taking the entire skull off of the creature it hit, stopping just short. He yanked it free before kicking back the next ghoul, bringing it down hard on the top of its head, splitting it like a log of firewood. Julius let go of the handle so he could grab onto the next creature, wrapping his hand around its throat before unleashing a barrage of punches with his brass knuckles. As the lifeless corpse fell to the ground, he looked back at the other two, who had stood motionless as he went on his rampage. Sorry, he said with a sheepish shrug. Sometimes I get excited about new toys. Atticus chuckled. I can see that, he said. Save some of that energy, Madison said, stepping up and clapping him on the shoulder. We got a long night ahead of us. Of course, Julius said with a grin, and retrieved his axe before following them over to the fence. There were a few creatures in the backyard who were shambling in their direction, but there wasn't a fence in the next yard, just a barbed wire makeshift one at the back. Atticus looked past the ghouls, seeing that the next yard was fenced in. Let's get past this group and hit the fenced-in yard, he suggested. Everybody nodded, and they hopped the fence, none of them particularly concerned with the ghouls. They spread out, picking up a bit of steam in order to knock them out of their path before strolling to the next yard. They hopped over, getting into the yard and looking down the row. There were only a handful of creatures shambling about. However, the moaning from the creatures they ran through was attracting some of the creatures from the front of the houses. Atticus looked at his watch. Okay, we're hitting the rest of this row, and then we gotta move, he said. They nodded as they went up to the house, ready to ransack it in the hopes that it had what they needed. Twenty minutes later, the trio stood in the kitchen of the last house. There were a dozen glass containers on the counter. Most were mason jars with the lids on them, but four were larger liquor bottles. Madison ripped strips off of sheets to use as the fuses, while Atticus and Julius counted out the bullets they'd found during their searches. Sixty-three. Julius declared. So, now the question is, do we want them spread out evenly? Atticus asked, tapping his chin. Or just do a few heavy hitters? Do the liquor bottles, Madison instructed. We'll know where they are in the heat of battle, and they can hold more. The ex-ranger nodded and shrugged. Works for me, he said. The two men began dropping bullets into the bottles as she used her knife to punch holes in the tops of the mason jar lids. How are we doing on time? Julius asked. Atticus checked his watch. If we're out the door in the next ten minutes, we'll be fine, he said. If you can finish this up, I'll get us something to carry them in, Julius offered. Saw a couple of backpacks in the kids' room. As he ran off, Atticus blinked down at his job, then shook his head at himself before continuing. Madison, noticing the pause, bumped him lightly with her elbow. You good? she asked. He nodded. Yeah, just not happy with myself for becoming so numb to all of this, he said. 
He said he was getting kids' backpacks, and there wasn't any other thought other than, great, that's what we need. Those kids are probably outside roaming around with their parents, either bitten by them or the other way around. He inclined his head towards a family photo on the wall, the kids not looking much older than eight or nine. My daughter could have very easily ended up like them. She's lucky to have you, Madison said. Yeah, just wish more kids were that lucky, Atticus murmured, focusing hard on the bullets so he didn't have to focus on his dank thoughts. You can only do what you can do, Madison said firmly as she jammed her knife into another lid. I know, just... Atticus trailed off, struggling to articulate what he was feeling. Finally, he said, I don't want to become numb to the horror. She shook her head. I was numb well before all this started, she admitted. Undercover work will do that to you, Atticus said, nodding in understanding. Julius came back in from the back carrying a couple of small backpacks with cartoon characters on them. Atticus and Madison shared a glance and a subtle nod, as if encouraging each other to stay focused, stay in the moment. All right, here we go, Julius said. So what's the plan? Car dealerships on the edge of town, Madison said. Should be light protection on that side. We've never hit anything this far away, so I doubt they're expecting us. Even with them kidnapping Jean? Julius asked, cocking a brow. Given how they left us, I wouldn't be surprised if they think we're dead, Atticus put in. Madison nodded. Even with the skeleton crew, we're going to have our hands full, she said. Quick strike, take them down, then start setting the cars on fire. That's the bombing run part, Julius said, crossing his arms. Then what? We drop the bombing part and we just run, Atticus said. Madison tilted her head back and forth. Well, he's half right, she amended. We hold their attention for as long as we can before retreating back to here. Julius blinked at her incredulously. Back to here? he demanded. You want to run back into this zombie-infested place? We're sure on allies, Atticus said, pointing towards the window. And those things outside are the closest thing we have. With any luck, they'll surround us, and we can hold them up until we get the old clear sign from Max, Madison added. Julius let out a long sigh. I knew I should have taken the truck back to town, he moaned. Atticus clapped him on the back. Atta boy, he said brightly. That's the spirit. Come on, we have a fight to pick, Madison said, and whirled a hand around her head. They loaded up their explosives and headed to the back door, ready to bring the fight to the deserters. Chapter 3 The trio inched up along the side of the road under cover of darkness, their vehicle a good half-mile behind them, not wanting to alert the guards to their presence. Atticus took point, finding a small tree by the side of the road, about a quarter mile out from the edge of town. They took up position and he broke out his assault rifle with the night vision scope, clicking it on and scanning the area. What do you see? Madison asked softly. Small barricade, Atticus replied in a low voice. Looks like some overturned desks from the car dealership down the road. Some cars on either side of that to extend the barricade out some. Resistance? she asked. I see two guards sitting behind the desks, their feet propped up. Atticus replied and scanned a bit more, looking up to the top of the dealership which was just behind the barricade. Got movement up there as well on the roof. One man. Sharpshooter, if I had to guess, Madison said. The moon was mostly behind the clouds, making for a dark experience outside. Atticus continued to scan the area, looking for some way to get to the top of the building, but he couldn't see one. Damn, looks like the access is from the inside of the building, he murmured. If we don't take him out, we're going to be sitting ducks out there, Julius hissed. I might have an idea, the ex-ranger said, and scanned the field, looking far to the left of the barricade and not seeing any movement. I think we can flank them. And then what? Julius asked. You and I are going to take them out, while Madison shows off her shooting skills, Atticus said simply, 
lowering the scope and glancing over at her. Assuming you can hit from this far out. Her gaze shot daggers at him, clearly stating, Are you kidding me? And he held up a hand, chuckling. Okay, keep those daggers for the bad guys, he said in surrender. She took out her rifle, looking through it towards the target. Only question is, do you want me to take him out before or after you strike? She asked. Atticus turned to Julius, and they had a silent debate for a few moments. Might be good to have a diversion, the latter finally said, their attention focused away from where we're coming. Agreed, the ex-ranger said, and glanced at his watch. Seven minutes, and you shoot. Madison revealed her watch, and they synchronized them, getting the timer going at the same time. Atticus pulled off his explosives bag and left it with her, setting it next to the other one. Seven minutes. I'd get a move on, she urged. Atticus nodded to Julius, and the duo sprinted far out from the road, making sure there was plenty of room between them and the barricade. As they ran, however, the moon began to come out from behind a cloud, prompting Atticus to grab Julius and pull him to the ground. It was a short break in the clouds, thankfully, so it was only a moment of moving light, but it would have been bright enough for the sharpshooter to spot them. They lay there, unmoving and tense, hoping that them being bathed in light wouldn't give them away. It took a full minute for the moon to vanish behind the clouds again, giving them the darkness they needed. They got up and continued running, Atticus with a knife in his hand and Julius with his brass knuckles, ready to strike as they approached the line of vehicles. The ex-ranger quickly leapt over them to get behind the line, looking both ways and relieved not to see anybody. They started moving down the line, staying close to the vehicle barricade to conceal their movement as much as possible. The two guards were a good two hundred yards away, as Atticus looked at his watch. Ninety seconds before Madison took her shot. He showed Julius and they picked up the pace. Under normal situations, it wouldn't be any issue to cover that distance in the time they had, but with them crouch running to stay low in the shadows, it was a bit more of an effort. Finally, they got within fifteen yards of the barricade, which was pushed forward just a bit from the line. Even though they were that close, they were still behind the guards, thankfully. Atticus turned back to Julius, giving him hand signals to show what they were going to do. Julius gave him a thumbs up and they got ready to strike. The ex-ranger watched the seconds tick down on his countdown. As soon as it hit zero, he heard a rifle shot go off in the distance. He didn't look up to see if it hit the target, putting his faith and his life into Madison's hands. The two men sprinted out from the darkness, running straight towards their respective guards who had managed to get to their feet and aimed frantically in the dark for the shooter. Before they could find her, though, the duo was upon them. Atticus led with his knife at neck level, catching the unaware man right in the side of the neck, driving the blade all the way through to the hilt. He was dead before he even knew the enemy was there. Julius had a more vicious approach, getting up to the man and swinging his brass knuckles into his temple, nearly ending his life in one punch. It was enough to drop him to the ground, convulsing from the impact. Julius didn't let up, delivering several more head punches before crushing his skull under his boot in a fit of rage that was a little concerning to the ex-ranger. You good? Atticus asked dryly. Peachy, Julius huffed with one more crunch of his boot heel. Get that rifle, you might need it, Atticus said. His companion nodded and did so as the ex-ranger gave Madison a thumbs up. She was already on her way towards them with the bags. As she arrived, she handed Atticus's back over. We're still standing, so I'll say good shot, he drawled. She rolled her eyes, as if I'd miss from that range. She shot back and reached down to grab the other rifle, slinging it over her shoulder while keeping her original one at the ready. The trio walked over to the car dealership, moving slowly up the side and ready for anything. They made it to the front and looked out, finding about thirty cars still in the massive lot. Madison pulled the keys to the SUV from her pocket and tossed them to Julius. Run as fast as you can and get the SUV down here, she said. Reverse park it right on the other side of the barricade with the keys in it. 
When we retreat, I want to just be able to turn the keys and hit the gas. He nodded firmly. Work before you know it, he promised, and tore off into the darkness. There isn't much to our left, just a few houses, Madison said. The heart of town is straight ahead and to our right, so when they come at us, it'll be from there. Atticus nodded thoughtfully. So, how do you want to set it up? he asked. She took a deep breath. It's risky, but I can get on the roof and... Way too risky, he cut in, shaking his head vehemently. If the ladder is inside, it'll take too much time to retreat, especially if they come at us full force. Okay, what do you propose? she asked. He thought for a moment, taking a step out and looking into the dealership. He smiled when he spotted the front window completely shattered, like something had driven through it. On the other side of it was a giant SUV sitting on top of a platform. Think you can hit some shots from up there? Atticus asked. Madison looked and smiled while nodding. Good eight feet off of the ground, clear line of sight with nothing to break through, she said. I can cover you two just fine. Atticus thought for a moment, looking back at the dead guards who were a few yards back. He walked over to one of them, picking up a radio from one of the corpses. He let out a big smile. Okay, I know how we're doing this, he said. As soon as Julius gets back, we're going to raise some hell. Chapter 4 Atticus and Julius ran through the outer edges of the lot, taking the liquor bottles and gently setting them in the middle of the cars. Rather than throw and let them break, they used them as delayed time bombs, so once the offensive began, they'd have unexpected backup. Given the bullets were inside a glass chamber rather than a gun, it was highly unlikely they'd actually hit anybody, but it would hopefully make enough noise to buy them a few moments to escape when the time came. As they got set up, Madison positioned herself on top of the SUV inside the showroom. She clicked on her night vision scope, peering through it to get her sight lines towards the two roads that the enemy would most likely be coming down. Once she had her bearings, she looked over to Atticus, who was placing the final liquor bottle in position, right in the middle of the lot. There were a couple dozen cars spread out, with the ones at the outer rim being the ones with the bullet decoys. Atticus looked over at Julius, who gave him a nod that he was ready to go. The ex-ranger looked back towards Madison and gave her a thumbs up, which she saw through her scope. She pulled out a small flashlight and gave it a couple of clicks, letting him know she was good to go. Well, here goes nothing, he said, and pulled out the walkie-talkie, readying it and taking a deep breath before clicking it on. Contact! Contact! he cried in a frantic tone. Westgate! He fired off a few shots with his assault rifle. It's a raid! So many of them! He paused for a moment, hoping that they would respond. It took just a moment before the line came back. What are their numbers? The replying soldier asked, and he sounded far too calm for Atticus's liking. Twenty! Thirty! Atticus cried. Send everybody! He fired a few more times and yelled incoherently before letting go of the radio. Hold your position, the soldier barked, finally sounding a bit concerned. We're on our way! The ex-ranger grinned and shoved the walkie in his pocket. We're on, he yelled, and pulled out his lighter, prompting Julius to do the same. They both lit up one of their Molotovs at the same time, chucking them into one of the vehicles without the added bullet's surprise. As those fires raged, Atticus and Julius moved back one row, taking up position behind cars on the second row. Atticus turned back and looked towards Madison, who was watching the incoming traffic. He had to look through his night vision scope to be able to see her. After several moments, she spotted SUVs coming from both roads, speeding towards them. She quickly motioned towards the two directions, and Atticus went to work. He lit up the next one, looking over to Julius and doing a hand motion to signal him to throw it into the booby-trapped ones. They popped up and tossed it towards the respective vehicles and ducked back down both weapons finding their targets. No shots came their way, so they both assumed that they weren't spotted. 
Madison took stock of the situation, spotting four total SUVs filled with armed men. They weren't in their full gear, and not even wearing vests. Looks like we woke them up, she murmured, and picked a target, one of the guys in the back, hoping she could pick a couple of them off before they caught on to her. She found her target, lined up the shot, and squeezed the trigger. The bullet ripped through the man's chest, dropping him to the ground in a heap, with only the man directly in front of him taking notice. She quickly adjusted her aim and fired again, hitting the man in the shoulder. Damn it, she snapped at herself. As he screamed in pain, the rest of the group immediately opened fire, shooting towards the building wildly. Rather than retreat, Madison stood her ground, aiming towards the far end of the formation, squeezing the trigger and hitting center mass on the man, dropping him to the ground. This forced everybody to rush up to one of the vehicles with a bullet trap in it. She quickly motioned to Atticus, who nodded and lit up another Molotov, throwing it in a high arc. It landed on the roof of the vehicle. The ex-soldiers were taking cover behind, spraying flaming liquid all over them. One of the men seemed to see where the Molotov had come from and opened fire, forcing Atticus to hit the deck as the bullets ripped through the glass on the vehicle. Julius leapt up from his position and unloaded his assault rifle in their direction, quickly ripping through half of a magazine. While he hit absolutely nothing, it was enough of a diversion to allow Atticus to retreat to the next line of cars, roughly halfway to the building. Julius was forced to hit the deck as other teams of soldiers opened fire, narrowly missing him. He was in a tough spot, but luckily the trap car started going off, sending shots through the air. It was incredibly noisy, creating a bit of a panic amongst the deserters who took cover. Julius looked down at his bag, still containing four Molotovs. Hell with it, he muttered, and flicked open his lighter, dropping it in the bag. The rags went up quickly, and he tossed the bag as far as he could towards the two teams of soldiers pinned down by the trap cars. As soon as he let it go, he took off running towards the dealership building. The bag landed just short of the soldiers, the glass shattering on impact. A split second later, there was a giant fireball that completely engulfed a couple of them. As they writhed on the ground in pain, their partners opened fire towards Julius. Just before he could get to cover, a bullet caught him in the shoulder, dropping him to the ground in a ton of pain. Atticus saw him go down and started working his way over, his rifle at the ready. He stayed low, moving between the cars quickly, not wanting to be exposed for too long. He peeked over the hood of one of the vehicles, seeing that a trio of soldiers were moving up towards Julius, ready to finish the job. He looked over to Julius, making eye contact with him, no more than twenty yards away. Atticus motioned for Julius to move away from him, putting a bit of distance between him and the opening between the cars. Julius did as instructed, making it a difficult angle, which would force them to come through the opening between the cars in order to get a shot at him. Atticus lay in wait, aiming towards the opening as the gunfire behind him intensified. He knew they didn't have long before they were going to have to retreat, hoping that Madison could hold her own while he saved Julius. A few seconds later, the leader of the trio emerged from the opening, turning towards Julius. Before he could pull the trigger, Atticus opened fire, ripping through his lower back and sending him to the ground. The next two soldiers tried to retreat from the opening, but Atticus was able to get a shot off, catching one of them in the arm and forcing him to drop his weapon. The other opened fire through the car, nearly hitting Atticus, who did get nicked with some flying glass. He returned fire, shooting through the car, but his gun went empty as he fired. As he scrambled to reload, the gunman hopped up on the car in order to get a better angle to take him out. As the soldier aimed, his head exploded, the force of the shot sending him tumbling off the car. Atticus glanced back, spotting Madison who was motioning for him to retreat. After their eyes met, she resumed laying down suppressing fire. Atticus slapped another magazine into the gun and rushed over to Julius. As he crossed the opening between the cars, he saw the wounded soldier attempting to raise his handgun towards him. Atticus did a spray and pray, sending bullets towards him while still running. Much to his surprise, 
His technique worked, hitting the soldier several times. He quickly made it over to Julius, helping him up. You all right? I got you, Atticus said. Julius groaned. That son of a bitch shot me, he said. I avenged you, Atticus said. Now come on, we gotta move. He helped him up off of the ground, Julius still in a bit of shock from being shot. As they hobbled towards the escape vehicle, the gunshots intensified, as well as the other traps blowing off. This bought them just enough time to get around the building. Madison just ahead of them and making a run for the driver's side door. Julius broke away from Atticus's help, able to run under his own strength now that the shock was wearing off a bit. As they reached the getaway vehicle, Atticus turned back towards the dealership, sending a few rounds towards the edge of the building, hoping to hold them off for a few more seconds to give Julius time to get in. As soon as the door slammed shut, he leapt for the shotgun seat, jumping in and pulling it shut behind him. Go, 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 he barked. Madison popped the SUV into gear, punching the gas and speeding away from the dealership as bullets flew their way. Atticus turned and watched the soldiers retreat back from the building quickly. Madison stopped no more than half a mile away from the barricade, waiting. Are they following us? she asked. They were running back hard, Atticus said. You don't do that if you're giving up. There were several tense moments as they waited to see if they were actually going to be followed. A few moments later, the headlights from the lead vehicles emerged from the side of the building, quickly building up speed and slamming through the desks that made their barricade. Oh, they're pierced, Atticus said. Good, Madison said, and hit the gas, picking up speed and doing her best to keep them at a safe distance. All right, Max, it's your show. Chapter 5 Max got his group moving up the road towards the edge of town, stopping a quarter mile short and staying covered by darkness. It was him and two older men with hunting rifles, and he pulled out his set of night vision binoculars. He looked towards the edge of town, seeing a makeshift barricade made by a trio of cars stretched out end to end across the road. He focused on it for a moment, spotting a couple of guards who were standing a few yards apart, one of them having a smoke. They looked like they were on a leisurely break. Okay, as soon as they start up on the other side of town, you take out these two guards and hold your position here, Max instructed quietly. One of the hunters stiffened. We can help. I know you can help by taking out anybody that comes up to the barricade, Max cut in. I'm not trying to be a dick about this, but you were picked for this mission because you could shoot from a distance. I mean, how old are you? Fifty? Fifty-five? He let out a deep sigh, shaking his head. This is a hit-and-run mission. Only chance we have is for me to get in there, find Jean, and get the hell out before they figure out the decoy is actually a decoy. The hunters both downcast their eyes, looking contemplative and melancholy. He relaxed a little, sighing again. Look, you're good at what you do, he insisted, and that's all I need you to do. I know you're capable, because if you weren't, I wouldn't be putting my life in your hands. This seemed to bolster them, and one of the hunters straightened up tall. We'll cover you good, he declared. Okay, Max replied, clapping him on the shoulder. And once we're clear, our only mission is to get back to those grain elevators in Clyde. If we're lucky, we won't have anybody following us. The other hunter cocked his head. And if we're unlucky, he asked. Then we'd better hope the two shooters we left back there are as good as you guys, Max said gravely. Both men nodded and gunfire popped off in the distance. Here we go, he said. The trio watched intently, waiting for things to get started. A few moments passed, and they saw some faint light and smoke going up in the distance. The two hunters looked through their scopes towards the guards. Talk to me, Max urged. They're listening to their radios. One of them replied. Looks like they're having a debate about whether or not to respond. They continued to watch, not wanting to jump the gun on things. A solid minute passed before another ex-soldier emerged from a nearby building. He walked around with an air of self-importance, barking angry orders towards the two guards, who nodded and immediately got into a firing position, looking down the road towards the trio. 
I think they know something's up, the hunter whispered. Their boss doesn't look too happy. Sixty seconds, and I'm on the move, Max warned. We'll clear the road for you, the hunter promised. And watch those rooftops, Max reminded them. Don't really want to get popped in the back while escaping. If somebody moves that isn't you or Jean, we'll put them down, the other hunter declared. Max grinned. I knew I liked you guys, he drawled. The trio sat there, waiting for the sixty seconds to tick away, and finally the time had come to make their move. Let's go, Max said, getting into a limbo ready to sprint position. On my mark, one of the hunters said. Three, two, one, now! Both hunters fired at the same time, taking out both targets. The ex-soldiers slumped backwards, one of them leaving a rifle on the hood of the car. The trio waited for several seconds to make sure that nobody was waiting to fire back, and when none came, Max darted out from cover. He pumped his legs hard, covering as much ground as he could as quickly as he could. He made it to the car and slid over the hood, landing beside the dead bodies. He drew his knife in one hand, handgun in the other. He huffed for a moment to make sure nobody was onto him, and when all was quiet, he started moving. If I were a hostage, where would I be? He looked towards the building where the boss had come out of, and shrugged, heading off towards it. Good a place as any to look, he thought. He made it to the door of the two-story building, which, upon looking through the window, revealed itself to be a furniture store. He didn't see any movement inside, so he went for the door, which was unsurprisingly unlocked. He slipped in, moving quickly but quietly, scanning the room for movement but not seeing any despite plenty of camping lanterns. As he walked through, he spotted gear laying on a table. There was ammunition, guns, and even vests. Definitely some place they frequent, he thought, and inspected the table. He heard movement coming from upstairs, along with muffled speaking, and he quickly rushed over to the stairwell, standing beside it, pressed up against the wall, both weapons at the ready. The footsteps and the voices got louder, and he listened carefully. He wasn't able to make out what they were saying, but could tell there were two different voices, and sets of footsteps. As they got towards the bottom of the stairs, he readied his move. Max hid in the darkness as he waited on the two men to get downstairs. The first one walked by him in a hurry, not noticing Max in the shadows. He was bitching about having to be up at this hour, mumbling curses as the other soldier was a couple of steps behind him. The second soldier didn't even fully get off the stairs before Max swung the knife at throat level, jamming it in pretty well. The soldier fell to the ground gurgling, which got the attention of his buddy, who quickly turned around. Max raised his handgun, aiming it straight at the man who was a few yards away from him. You don't do anything stupid, and you might live through this, he warned. The soldier raised his hand slowly. Okay, take it easy now, he declared. You have no idea how badly you've messed up, friend. I'm not the one with the gun pointed at me, Max spat. But I'm not the one surrounded by a hundred soldiers who will rip you to shreds if they realize you're here, the soldier shot back. Max rolled his eyes, knowing the guy would continue to bluff if he didn't do anything about it. So he aimed his gun just to the side of the man, squeezing off a single round into the wall. The soldier startled, his body shaking. Max stood there calmly, raising an eyebrow. Well, I'm sure that hundred soldiers will be here any second to save you, he drawled, playfully looking around and tapping his foot. Huh, maybe they're still napping. He put a finger to his chin. Or maybe they're getting their asses handed to them by my friends on the other side of town. The soldier seemed to realize he was in real trouble, and his tone and demeanor completely changed. Okay, man. Just take it easy now, he stammered. We can talk this out. Where's my friend? Max demanded, voice lethal. What friend? The soldier asked shakily. He snarled. The one you assholes kidnapped a few hours ago in Wallace, he cried. Oh, him, the soldier said with a wince. Yeah, I guess I should offer my condolences. Max clicked the hammer back on his gun. For your sake, you better not finish that sentence the way you are thinking of finishing it he warned. Hey man, I didn't do it, the soldier protested. Is he dead? Max demanded, staring him down. 
probably wishes he was, the soldier said with a wince. Max didn't like the sound of that. Where is he? he asked. In town, the soldier said quickly. I could take you to him. Max didn't hesitate, lowering his gun and firing into the man's leg. As his kneecap exploded and he howled in pain, his captor approached him slowly, making sure to keep out of arm's reach. Well, you see, Max drawled, I'm in a hurry, and I don't think you're going to be able to keep up with me. So why don't you just do us both a favor and tell me where he is? The soldier groaned from his kneeling position, but didn't speak, fussing over his busted knee. Okay, have it your way, Max said, and cocked the hammer back again. Wait, wait, the soldier hissed. He's in the back of the hardware store. Where? Max snapped. A block to the north, on the corner. The words tumbled out of the soldier's mouth so fast. Only place that's going to be lit up. You can't miss it. Max continued to aim the handgun at the soldier, contemplating pulling the trigger. Nah, I'm better than that, he murmured, and looked around. He spotted a blanket on the back of a couch and tossed it over. Use that to stop the bleeding, he instructed. And when the soldier took it, he aimed his handgun directly at the quivering man's forehead. Just remember, I could have ended you right here, right now, but I showed you mercy. Next time you have one of us civilians in your sights, think about this moment. He put his gun away, giving the wounded soldier a smack on the chest before getting up and running towards the north exit of the store. He stopped at the door, looking out on the road and not seeing anything, hoping that the diversion had pulled them all that way. As soon as he opened the door, footsteps echoed on the street, and he glanced over, surprised to see two soldiers on patrol. They seemed just as surprised to see him, and they all stood there for a moment, frozen and blinking dumbly at each other. Max finally decided to make a run for it, firing his handgun in their direction, wildly as he took off. He didn't hit anything, but it did force the duo to take cover before they could raise their weapons. As he got up the road a bit, they managed to return fire, and as soon as the first bullet flew, he began to zigzag, moving as erratically as he could to make it more difficult for him to be hit. He was aided by the darkness, at least, and luckily made it to the next block, quickly spotting the hardware store. He didn't hesitate, rushing towards the front door, his gun still at the ready, he threw open the door and quickly closed it, taking up a position by a display by the front window, looking back towards where he'd come from. A few seconds later, the soldier on patrol showed up, scanning the area. After weighing their options, they pointed towards the hardware store and started moving over to it. Damn it, Max huffed and thought it over, deciding that opening fire now would be a bad idea. So he retreated into the store, hoping that the guy he'd shot was telling the truth about Jean. As he moved, he listened carefully, trying to make sure he wasn't rushing into a trap. All he could hear was faint moaning, not from a zombie, but from someone clearly in a lot of pain. He went into the back room, horrified by what he saw. Jean had been strapped down to a table, his shirt ripped off, and he'd been worked over pretty good. His chest was bloody, his face bruised, and next to him was a tray of tools, all crimson with blood. Oh, Jean, what did they do to you, buddy? Max gasped, approaching the table slowly. The wounded man's head lolled, but his eyes fixed on Max with surprise and awe. They tried to get me to talk, he said hoarsely, but I didn't. I swear to you, I didn't. I believe you. Max whispered. I believe you. The door opened in the next room, and he put his finger up to his mouth to signal to his friend to be quiet. I gotta get you out of here, he whispered even quieter. Jean shook his head. They've hurt me too bad, he whispered back, nodding down to his gut. There was a large bandage, and Max gingerly lifted the edge, dropping it quickly when he saw the horrific carnage beneath. Noise echoed in the main portion of the store, and the footsteps grew closer. Don't leave me alive for them, Jean begged. Come on, Max argued. Cut my throat and get out of here, Jean whispered, the sound forceful even in its quiet. I haven't talked, but I think I might if they do much more to me. 
Max didn't think that was true, but that the man was once again heroically saying it to make it easier for him to not take him along. As the footsteps grew louder, nearly to the door, Max finally nodded and patted his friend on the chest. He looked around, finding the back door open just a bit. He got on the other side of the table and fired towards the soldiers in the front room, hoping to hold them down for a few seconds. He pivoted to Jean and fired a bullet right into his temple, point blank and quick and painless. At least that was what he told himself as he rushed out the back door, slamming it shut behind him. Rather than double back the way he'd come, he started running toward the east, hoping to put a couple of blocks between him and his pursuers, and also hoping they didn't have reinforcements nearby. He got a block up when the soldiers burst out of the back door of the hardware store. As soon as he heard the unmistakable sound of a metal door smacking against the back of the building, Max turned as he ran, firing backwards a few times. The shots were far off of the mark, but did the job he needed them to, which was to buy him a few seconds by forcing the soldiers to duck back inside to avoid being shot. Max made it to the next corner, making a turn just as the soldiers started firing at him, hitting the wall of the building and narrowly missing him. He pumped his legs hard, trying to outrun his pursuers. However, he was two full blocks to the edge of town, and a couple of blocks over from where his backup was going to be aiming for. Max knew they were going to catch up to him soon, and would most likely be flanking him, so he did the only thing he could do. At the next street, he made a turn down it, finding a building with a glass front door. He fired several times, weakening it enough that he could jump through it. He landed hard on the ground, sliding along the top of the broken glass, getting cut up pretty good in the process. He scrambled to his feet, pushing the pain down, knowing much worse was headed his way if he didn't keep moving. He ran through the small general store, rushing down the aisles and hoping to get to the back door before they caught up to him. He managed to get back to the other side of the building, busting out the back door into a small alleyway. He looked around, a little panicked because he wasn't in a great spot. He ran up just a bit and found a small walkway between the buildings. He didn't have another option, and began running down it as hard as he could, keeping his handgun at the ready. Luckily for him, he got to the end of the alley and to the final street, seeing the row of cars as the barricade. He didn't pause to look both ways, instead running as hard as he could. As soon as Max emerged from the alley, shots went off to his left, but his speed seemed to catch the soldier off guard, so he wasn't able to get a clean look at him. Max ran and dove headfirst over the car, landing hard on the ground. He looked around, seeing he was a hundred yards or so away from the main road, where his help was. You better have heard that, he prayed, and positioned himself by the wheel well, making himself as small as possible, and hoping that the hunters were still there and doing their job. Come on, come on, come on, he chanted in his head as the soldier's footsteps grew closer and closer. He reloaded his rifle, and a few seconds later, a shot went off in the distance, quickly followed by the sound of the soldier collapsing to the ground. He leaned over, looking underneath the car and seeing the man lying dead with a bullet in his head. Max frantically waved in the other direction, trying to let the hunters know he had another one on his tail. Wait, why am I still waving? It's not like they can respond, he thought, berating himself and psyched himself up to go. Okay, okay, get up and go. Now! He willed himself to his feet, running as hard as he could. As he went, gunshots came from both in front of and behind him. It was a quick spray of bullets, but that was it, and no explosions of pain on his body, so he hoped his side won. He finally reached his men breathing heavily, adrenaline coursing through his veins. The hunters continued to scan the town, looking for potential threats, but finding none. Where's Jean? one of them finally asked. Max shook his head, lying smoothly. They killed him. Damn it, the hunter cursed. We have to assume he talked. Jean wouldn't talk, Max argued, shaking his head, and he knew he was on a slippery slope here. We can't take that chance, the hunter said. Max gritted his teeth, thinking for a beat, realizing he was in a no-win situation. He told me he didn't talk, and I believed him, he said. 
The hunter paused, staring at him with a furrowed brow. I thought you said they killed him, he asked. For all intents and purposes they did, Max amended. They tortured him within an inch of his life. His guts were hanging out. The hunter gaped at him. You killed him? he asked. I put him out of his misery, Max replied, trying not to sound petulant and defensive. Even if there was a way to get him to safety, which there wasn't, he would have died before we got him back home. The hunters exchanged a quick look, and then a nod, which gave him a little bit of relief at least. Okay, the first one said slowly. We may be old, but we're honest. We believe you, but if you ever lie to us like that again, we'll shoot you ourselves. Max nodded solemnly, then got up, having finally caught his breath. Come on, let's get back to the trucks, he said. We need to see if Madison needs a hand. The two hunters nodded, and the trio ran off into the darkness of the night, hoping their assistance wasn't required. Chapter 6 Madison continued to drive towards Loomis as the soldiers followed behind them, taking shots. Atticus had his seat reclined all the way back so he could look at Julius's wound, which was pretty significant. Hang in there, buddy, Atticus urged as he put pressure on it. We're going to get you patched up. Julius was fading in and out of consciousness, blood pouring from the wound every once in a while moaning and giving a weak squirm. He's losing a lot of blood, the ex-ranger said. Damn it, Madison cursed. Can you bypass Loomis and lose them? Atticus asked, turning a little to look out the window. The mission comes first, she said flatly, though he could hear the underlying agony in her tone. I don't think we can move him, he insisted. She smacked the steering wheel. The mission comes first, she yelled. Before Atticus could argue with her, Julius groaned. She's right, man, he said, his words a little slurred and garbled. I ain't gonna be the reason we lose the town. Gunshots continued flying their way, hitting the vehicle, one of which hit the back tire. Madison growled and struggled to keep it on the road, but managed to do it. We got a mile to go, she warned through gritted teeth. They're going to catch us. On it. Atticus said, and climbed into the back of the vehicle, getting into the back area and aiming his assault rifle towards them through the broken window. He opened fire, but with as janky as the movements of the SUV were, thanks to the blown tire, it was difficult to get a proper aim. Still, the firing on his part forced them to back off just a bit, enough to get them to town, which was going to be its own set of problems. Madison stared down the entrance to the town, which was barricaded with numerous cars and dozens of creatures just behind it. The car line extended out a ways from the road, replaced with fencing past that. Zombies stretched out along it as well, with more coming, attracted by the noise in the distance. Hang on, this is going to get rough, Madison warned, and pulled the SUV off of the road, nearly losing control of it without the back tire intact. Everybody inside struggled to stay upright and not go flying around in the cab, especially Atticus, who was still in the back. She managed to get control enough to straighten the SUV out, aiming it straight for a chain-link fence with several zombies behind it. Hang on, she bellowed, and accelerated. The SUV blasted through the fence, sending several zombies flying through the air. Madison managed to steer the speeding vehicle towards the gap between two houses, and out to the street, which was filled with ghouls. She spotted a house with an open garage door a few houses down, and sped towards it. She rolled over several zombies, not able to maneuver the SUV around them, sparks flying up from the bare rim that was left. She drove into the garage, smacking ghouls along the way, not able to stop before she hit the wall, sending everyone lurching forward. Atticus dove from the vehicle, popping off his rifle, hitting the closest creature in the head, giving them a few moments. Dozens more headed in their direction, and he smacked the side of the SUV. We gotta get this door shut, he yelled. Madison emerged from the other side of the vehicle, pulling out her handgun and firing several shots into the motorized pulley system, severing the chain from it. She ran over, leapt up, grabbed the door, and manually slammed it to the ground. 
Atticus popped a fresh mag into the assault rifle before tossing it to Madison. Cover the front door. I'll get him inside, he instructed. She nodded, rushing inside and doing a quick cursory check of the house. She figured with the open garage door and no vehicle that whoever had lived there had made a break for it. She was relieved to find out that her assumption was correct, and there were no zombies inside. She rushed to the front door, throwing the deadbolt and taking up position at the front window. So far, it was nothing but dozens of zombies shambling their way. She knew that the ex-soldiers wouldn't be content with just trapping them in the town, not after the damage they'd caused. Atticus came stumbling into the living room with Julius, who was looking worse for wear. His shoulder was completely crimson, soaked with blood, and the towel he was using to stop the bleeding was also bright red. He managed to get the big guy down from the couch. I need you to hold this in place, Atticus said, and Julius raised his good arm, pushing down on it lazily. Focus, Atticus barked, snapping his fingers in front of the wounded man's face. I'm not about to lose you. Now put pressure on this. Julius blinked a few times, seeming to remember where he was, and pressed harder, nodding in agreement. I got you, man. I got you, he said through his teeth. Atticus nodded. Good. I'll be right back, he said, and rushed to the bathroom, quickly going through the cabinets in there before finding a small first aid kit. He found some rubbing alcohol as well before returning to the living room. I'm going to have to stitch you up, he warned. I need you over here before you do that, Madison called. It's cool, Julius said, inclining his head over to her weakly. Do what you gotta do. Atticus went over to Madison, and they looked out the window together, staring at the mob of ghouls heading their way. We can't stay here, she said. There's too many of those things. If we get trapped in here... We'll be easy targets, Atticus finished with a nod. Yeah, hang on. He went to the back of the house, looking out at the smattering of ghouls coming at them, with no fence to prevent them from getting to the house. He moved back to Madison, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. Not too many of them back there, he said. At least, not yet. Get him patched up, because we're going to have to move, she said, inclining her head towards Julius. Atticus shook his head. We're not going to be able to move him, he admitted. Then we stash him here, she said. He pursed his lips, thinking for a moment before stepping away from the window, looking down the hallway and finding an attic door. He pulled it down, climbed up, and looked around. It was dusty, but empty. We can put him in the attic, he said as he returned. Come back for him later. Madison cocked her head. You good with that big fella? she asked. Julius let out a low, weak chuckle. As long as I don't have to run, I'll be called Big Fella. I'm down with it, he groaned. Madison chuckled and continued watching out the window. Get him patched up, get him some supplies, and get him up there, she instructed. By the time you have that done, I'll have a plan. She took a deep breath and thought, I hope... Chapter 7 Atticus finished patching Julius up as best he could and helped him up to the attic. It was no easy feat getting him up the ladder, but he made it and set him up in the makeshift nest he'd built for him. I'll stay quiet up here, Julius promised through the hole as Atticus climbed down to stand next to Madison. It could take a day or two for us to get back to you, she warned. He smiled weakly. I got food pillows, and a stack of trashy romance novels, he joked. I think I'll manage. Good luck, man, Atticus said. You too, Julius replied. Madison, make sure this man gets back home. She nodded solemnly and pushed the attic door up, sealing him in. She took a deep breath and readied her weapon. So, how are we playing this? she asked. Get a couple blocks back, put some distance between us and Julius. Atticus replied. Figure it out from there. She nodded, and they headed to the back door, which was now partially blocked by a dozen creatures. Atticus looked at the back door, which swung outwards. He gave it a light tap, nodding to himself when he realized it was pretty stout. They're only a couple deep at the door, he said. Get over to the kitchen window. See if you can pull a few your way. Madison nodded, rolling her shoulders. Then what? 
she asked. I'll play fullback and clear a lane for you, he said. Then we run like hell. She shook her head. And what about the door? She asked, motioning to it. They're not getting into the attic, he explained. And if there are some of those things in here, they might just bypass the house if they decide to sweep the neighborhood. She wrinkled her nose, looking up. Hope Julius isn't a light sleeper, she murmured. She moved over to the window, knocking on it consistently for several moments, as Atticus ducked down behind the edge of the counter to stay out of sight from the ghouls outside. Over the next minute, he watched as half the mob outside shambled towards the new noise. I think that's as good as it's going to get, he murmured to himself, and Madison approached sidling in behind him. Stay close, he said, and she nodded, giving him a pat on the back. Atticus got up, moved to the door, turned the knob, and leaned back to get a bit of momentum. He then threw his entire weight behind the door, shoving it open and sending a couple of creatures to the ground. He got out the door, and Madison quickly stepped over the threshold, giving the zombie to the side a shove to get them just a few inches of room. They moved quickly, narrowly avoiding being grabbed by the ghouls as they broke into the backyard. They ran hard, getting to the net yard and up to the house, moving around the side of it. As Atticus came around the side, he was greeted by a zombie, and he grabbed it by the shirt, flinging it to the side before they continued on. They ran up to the front of the house, where there were dozens of ghouls in the road and yards of the houses. Only a couple of them noticed they were there and started shambling their way. Atticus didn't stop for long, breaking out from cover and running across the street. As they ran, dodging creatures as they went, a couple of shots rang out in the distance, barely missing them. One of the bullets caught a nearby zombie in the chest, knocking it off balance for a moment, before it regained its footing. Where the hell did that come from? Madison barked. Didn't see it. Just keep running, Atticus urged, huffing as they ran to the next house. The shots continued, with the zombie inadvertently providing them some cover. Atticus didn't stop, running to the backyard and hopping over the fence, sprinting to the next block. As soon as they hit the ground in a yard without a fence and barely any creatures, they ran right up to the house. Don't kill anything. We need to conceal where we are, Atticus instructed as he hit the back door. Madison worked on shoving the ghouls away as they got close. He began to work on the door rather than breaking the glass. He pulled out his knife and wedged it into the door mechanism. It took an extra moment, but he was able to break it open without leaving evidence of their break-in. We're in, he cried, and rushed inside. Madison darted in behind him and shut the door, securing it. Get to the other side of the house and make some noise. Pull those things away from the back door, he gushed. On it, she replied, and they rushed through the house, sweeping it as they went, making it to opposite sides before hitting the windows. They started banging on it for several moments, hoping to spread out the mob that was forming around the back door. It took a moment but they were finally able to make it look like any other house. Madison rushed back to the kitchen, looking out the back, but making sure to stay in the shadows. Atticus quietly approached her from behind. Anything? he asked. She shook her head. Nothing, at least not yet, she whispered back. I'll keep watch at the front, Atticus murmured. But before he could take a step, Madison's walkie-talkie made a noise, and he froze. She quickly pulled it out, bringing it to her lips. Max, she hissed, keeping the volume of the radio low. Thought you might need a hand, he replied. Looks like I was spot on. She let out a sigh of relief at the sound of his voice. Where are you? she asked, and Atticus moved closer so he could hear the whole conversation. Close enough to know that you kicked up a hell of a hornet's nest? Max quipped. What's it look like out there? she asked, keeping her voice quiet but steady. Looks like three strike teams, he came back. One's already in the town. The other two are staging outside the main barricade. Her gaze darkened and she shook her head. Yeah, we ran into one of them in the neighborhood here, she said dryly. Are you safe? he asked. She scoffed. If you call being surrounded by zombies and pursued by a military strike team safe, then yeah, relatively so, she said, unable to keep the sarcasm from her tone. Well, you're still sassy. So that's a positive at least, he quipped. The sass never dies, she shot back, 
and took a deep breath, closing her eyes. So, were you able to get Jean out? There was a slight pause before he replied. Jean's gone, but he didn't talk. She jutted out her chin, eyes snapping open. How do you know he didn't talk? She demanded, and Atticus put a hand on her arm, bringing a finger to his lips to remind her to be quiet. She nodded at him apologetically. We can go into it later, but the important thing is he didn't talk, and he's never going to talk, Max replied, voice level. She stared at the ceiling for a beat. Did you? She trailed off. Another pause and Max's voice came back hoarse with more than a little pain. I said we'll talk about it later, he said. Right now, we need to figure out how to get you three out alive. Just two of us for the moment, Madison replied, shaking her head. Julius got shot. Max cursed before asking, Is he dead? No, we stashed him in the attic, so we'll have to come back for him once all this blows over, she explained, rubbing her forehead as if to keep the stresses of the day stuck inside. That's a problem for future us, Max said firmly. So tell me, how can I help? Madison took a deep breath, straightening her shoulders. Who do you have with you? she asked. It's just me he replied slowly, and she winced, not wanting to hear those words. I sent the rest back to help out with the Wichita defense. Any other day that would have been the right call, she said with a sigh. Has anybody spotted you yet? Max asked. She shook her head. We're pretty confident they know there's three of us, she replied. The people who pursued us were the same ones we were fighting with. And at least one of them took a shot at us, Atticus piped up so she wouldn't forget. Oh yeah, Atticus and I are most likely made, she said into the radio. So nobody has eyes on Julius? Max asked. She peered out the window as if she could see the intentions of their pursuers. It's highly unlikely at this point, she said. Okay, came the reply. Assuming you pissed them off pretty good, and knowing you for as long as I have, I'm going to say that's a pretty safe bet. These boys might be going in for a full cleanse. Madison nodded, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. Which means it's only a matter of time before they find him, she said. Unless I can make them think he escaped, Max added. She froze. Hey, don't do anything stupid, she warned, voice lethal. You know me. I don't know how to do anything any other way, he joked. She growled. Max, she hissed, the name coming out like venom. Look, I couldn't do anything to save Jean he said, his voice softer, gentler than it was most days. But I can do something to save Julius. I'm far enough away from the staging area that I can sneak into town, work my way over in their direction, take a few pop shots at them, then escape. She threw up a hand. How the hell are you going to escape? She demanded. Got a truck here. Just gotta get to it, Max explained. After that, it's a race, and I'll be willing to bet that I know these roads a lot better than they do. Plus, you know me. Always have something up my sleeve. She sighed, looking at Atticus, and he shook his head, because there were no other options or ideas on the table. That's a hell of a risk, she finally said into the radio. Not nearly as big a risk of leaving Julius in that house with them looking for him, came the reply. She took a deep breath and nodded. Okay, she said. I trust your judgment. Oh, don't tell me that now, he drawled the lightness back in his tone. That's the kind of shit you hear on your deathbed when they're humoring you before you die. She chuckled. Just don't get yourself killed, she said. What are you two going to do? He asked. She glanced up at Atticus again and he simply shrugged. Still working on that one, she admitted. Now get moving before you change your mind. Copy that, he replied. See you back at home. The line went quiet, and the duo stayed still in the shadows, quietly contemplating for a few moments. Finally, Madison couldn't take it any more. So, you got any bright ideas? She whispered. Nothing particularly good, he replied in a low voice. Before their conversation could continue, noise came from the front of the house, a scratching, squeaky sound as if someone were trying to pick the lock on the front door. Atticus motioned for Madison to investigate it while he covered the back and both of them grabbed their assault rifles and readied them. The ex-ranger looked out back, spotting two soldiers flanking them, 
taking positions behind some trees. One of them dispatched a zombie with a knife and dragged it into the darkness to cover his tracks. Madison inched up towards the door, hearing the faint sound of metal scraping inside the locking mechanism. She backed up, taking up a position by the wall near the front room. She looked at the ceiling for a beat, readying herself for battle. There was no room here for worry, for Julius, for Max, for the town. All that mattered was that the mission came first, and the mission in that moment was to survive this raid. A moment later, the door unlocked and her finger was on the trigger, ready to strike. The door slowly began to open and she didn't even wait for the target to be visible. She sent three rounds through the door, which stopped moving. There wasn't any sound, no moaning or anything sounding like a collapse, which meant she didn't hit anything. A few tense seconds passed before the door shoved open. She frantically looked for a target, but there was nobody to shoot at. A second later, two hands from either side of the door tossed in lit Molotov cocktails. She ducked back behind the wall as they came crashing to the ground close to her. Madison yelled for Atticus while crawling on the hallway floor, frantically smacking her leg to put the flames out. They're at the front of the house, she screamed. Gunshots echoed from the front, but she couldn't tell who was shooting. A few seconds later, Atticus hid behind the couch, which was parallel with the hallway, but he didn't speak, not wanting to give away his position. He gave her a series of brief hand signals, letting her know that there were two men in the back of the house, and to move that way. Madison nodded as he popped up and shot towards the front door before retreating back into the kitchen. She quickly scrambled to her feet, getting to the bedroom at the far end of the hallway at the side of the house. She busted through the door, making a beeline for the window. When she got it open, she dove out headfirst, landing hard on the ground but immediately clearing the area from her back. She moved with haste to the back of the house, looking out at the backyard and scanning the tree line. It took her just a moment to spot the two soldiers hiding behind the trees, ready to strike when anybody came out the back door. She eyeballed it, figuring that at her position she had a shot at both of them. However, as soon as that trigger was pulled, she would have a second to readjust and fire again. She took a quick deep breath to steady herself, aiming at the gunman closest to her. Madison fired, hitting the first man in the side of the head and dropping him. She quickly adjusted her aim, just as the enemy did the same. They both fired at roughly the same time, with Madison sending several rounds towards him. The round he shot impacted the corner of the house, sending brick fragments towards her face, forcing her back and to the ground. It took her a moment to regain her bearings and get her full sight back. She looked back towards the trees, seeing him laying on the ground convulsing. She quickly got up and rushed towards the downed men, making sure they were out for good. As she approached the still-moving one, she pumped another round into him, just to be sure. Madison looked over to the house, seeing that it was engulfed in flames, with the occasional popping of gunfire going off. Atticus, she thought, and, as if on cue, the back door exploded open, the ex-ranger in question falling out of it while firing back into the house. He quickly scrambled to his feet, aiming the gun towards the trees, but didn't fire when he saw Madison. You okay? she asked as he ran over, reaching down and grabbing the dead soldier's rifle at the same time as he grabbed her hand, pulling her through the neighborhood. We gotta move, come on, he hissed, and she let him lead her through the darkness, dashing past creatures, trying not to knock them down as they went. They made it to the edge of the neighborhood, which led up to the downtown area that was crawling with ghouls. They stopped behind a house, Atticus wheezing from the smoke exposure. They looked behind them, but didn't see anybody pursuing them. Atticus couldn't hold in a cough, the smoke having done a number on his lungs. The noise drew the attention of several zombies near downtown, who moaned and began to shamble their way. Madison grabbed Atticus by the shirt and pulled him towards a nearby single-story house. Come on, she urged, and when they reached the back door, she broke the window and unlocked it from the inside. As soon as he was across the threshold, she slammed the door shut. He motioned for her to stay there as he caught his breath. Secure it, he huffed. I can clear the house. Atticus continued coughing as he shambled through the house, 
looking for trouble. As he did this, Madison looked outside at the zombies coming their way, and the door missing a window wasn't going to provide them with as much protection as she would like. She quickly looked around, spotting an antique dining room cabinet. She rushed over and moved it as best she could, ripping out one of the drawers in order to get a handhold. She strained, dragging it across the floor, but managed to get it over the broken window before the ghouls arrived. She let out one last grunt as she shoved the cabinet into position, hoping that between the weight of it and the deadbolt, it would at least buy them enough time to figure out what their next move was. Atticus came back into the room, still hacking up a lung. You going to make it? Madison asked. He didn't reply, simply entered the kitchen and opened up the pantry door, relieved to see some gallon jugs of water sitting on the floor. He popped one open and downed seemingly half the container, helping him regain his composure. I think I stayed in there just a bit too long, he gasped as he came up for air. Just give it a minute and cough it out. Madison instructed. Not like we're going anywhere for the moment. Atticus nodded, sitting down at the kitchen table, drinking some more water. She patted him on the back, rubbing for a beat before walking to the front of the house and looking discreetly through the window. A couple dozen zombies were headed their way, with even more behind them. Well, on the bright side, I don't see anybody who wants to shoot at us, she thought dryly. As she watched the shambling horde, she racked her brain for some kind of solution, any kind of idea. How are we getting out of this one? Chapter 8 Max dug through the back of the cab on the truck, pulling out a hunting rifle and slinging it over his shoulder. It wasn't his weapon of choice by a long shot, but it didn't really matter. He didn't need to land a kill shot, or really even hit anybody. He just needed to get their attention. He checked his handgun, which had a fresh magazine in it, and his knife. Okay, let's kick this bad idea off, he muttered, and started running away from the barricade, where the soldiers were prepping their assault, going several hundred yards further away. It was still dark out, and the moon was mostly behind clouds, but he didn't want to take any chances. He found a spot along the fence line where it was nothing but barbed wire and only a couple of ghouls in the yard. They were close to the house and not coming out in his direction yet. Max began to head towards it, but decided to play it extra safe by crawling across the open area on the ground, just in case the moon decided to pop out like a spotlight. He managed to get across the open area fairly quickly, getting up to the barbed wire fence just as the clouds moved. He sighed, rolling his eyes. Really? He huffed. I mean, really? He shook his head and used his knife to pry away the barbed wire from the post. It took a second before it was free, giving him a path underneath it. As soon as he got into the yard, he popped up, walking casually over to the two creatures in the yard. They were a fair distance apart from each other, making the dispatching of them easy. Once they were down, he moved to the side of the house. As he looked out towards the road and the neighborhood, he spotted a couple dozen creatures, all shambling around. Apparently, they were too far away from the chaos elsewhere in the neighborhood to be drawn towards it. Max knew he was on a tight timeline, that he had to get daring and risky. He had to intercept the strike teams before they got to where Julius was hiding, wherever that might be. I really should have asked that, he thought. Stupid. Max shook his head, getting him back to the moment. He figured he needed to get about five blocks up to have a chance at spotting the teams as they breached. He took a deep breath. That's a lot of zombies, he noted, rolling his shoulders and limbering up. Stop overthinking it. Just start running. He made sure to stay in the grass as he ran, wanting to minimize his noise. Even so, he attracted zombies towards him as he went. One creature spotted him, started moaning, and it was like a warning flare going up to every other creature within earshot. He only made it a few houses down before he started attracting a crowd. He lowered his shoulder, crashing through a few creatures and hoping to slow them down, but all he did was cause himself to tumble to the ground. 
luckily a couple of yards away from the ghouls he'd knocked down. He quickly scrambled to his feet as the mob started to close in on all sides of him. He looked across the street, seeing that there weren't as many of the things over there. He took off towards the road, the concern about the noise he would cause gone, because the cat was already out of the bag. Half the town seemingly knew where he was. Max knew he had to lose them or else he was going to be running right into a pincer when he confronted the soldiers. There were too many zombies for him to fight off, and they were too close for him to be able to get into a house to buy him some time, so Max did the only thing he could do. He spotted a house with a tall wooden privacy fence and rushed over to it. Just beside it was an air conditioning unit on the ground, which had a couple of creatures by it. He ran over, jamming the knife into the lead creature and shoving it back into the other one, buying him precious seconds. He got up on the AC unit and leapt over the fence without looking. As he was in the air, clearing the top of the wooden structure, he spotted a trio of creatures on the ground just below him, only a few yards away from where he was about to land. Shit, he hissed, and landed hard on the ground, immediately drawing the attention of the zombies in the backyard. They descended on him fast, and he crawled away as hard as he could. The wind had been knocked out of him, and he gasped for air all the while trying not to panic about the fact that he was about to be dinner. The lead creature that was a few steps ahead of the other two leaned down to try to bite him as he crawled backwards. Max raised his leg up in a desperate attempt to prevent that, planting his foot in the creature's chest and managing to kick it over the side. The ghoul tumbled to the ground, letting out an angry groan as it went. This bought Max enough time to get to his feet, but he was still too close to the other zombies. He was pissed off and let out a forceful grunt as he stabbed the next creature in the head and shoved it back into the other one. He wasn't done, unleashing his fury on the creature on the ground before turning towards the last one that had regained its footing. He stabbed it several times in the face before hitting the brain, dropping it for good. Max stood there for a moment to gather himself, breathing heavily and slowly to calm himself. He didn't have long, however, because the mob of creatures that had been following him was amassed at the gate. They were pushing hard, their weight causing the fence to sway and bend. He knew it wasn't going to hold long, so he started to move towards the back of the yard. By the time he got halfway across, the gate gave way, crashing to the ground and unleashing a few dozen creatures into the backyard. He was smarter about his fence hopping this time, jumping up and looking at his landing zone before pulling himself over. Much to his delight, the coast was clear. He got a running start, leaping up and using his momentum to cleanly jump the fence. He landed on his feet, looking around for threats, but none were in the immediate vicinity. Max continued his journey through the neighborhood, pausing at the next house, partially to catch his breath, but mostly to get a lay of the land. It was the house at an intersection, so he could see zombies everywhere. None were particularly close, but that could change if he kicked up some noise. Okay, I should be in line with the truck, so just need to remember the two-story house with the yellow shutters, he thought, psyching himself up. You can do this, Max. Just a little further. Max continued on, taking it at a brisk pace through the yards, staying away from the zombie-infested roads. There were plenty of fences to hop over. However, they were all chain-link, so they were easy to manage. And more importantly, there were no surprises awaiting him on the other side. As he got a couple of blocks up, he heard gunfire in the distance, and lots of it. Several guns popped off, all at once. They're not messing around, he murmured to himself. They're doing a full cleanse. He sighed heavily. This is not going to be fun. He spotted a house on the corner of the next block, with all the zombies heading away from it, moving towards the gunfire in the distance. He kept pace with the ghouls that were shambling away, not wanting to give them a reason to turn around. It took a couple of minutes before he was up to the house. He glanced into the bedroom window, finding it empty, so he broke in. He climbed into the house, pulling his knife and doing a quick sweep of the space. When he was sure the house was empty, he sheathed his weapon. Max moved to the other side of the building, 
setting up shop in the bedroom. The window overlooked the intersection, giving him a great view of what was going on. He raised the window a crack, just enough to allow him to get his hunting rifle barrel outside. He tilted his head back and forth, trying to keep from fidgeting too much as he talked to himself. Two shots and you're gone, he chattered, voice coming out quick and nervous. That's it. That's all you have to do. Two shots, then run like hell. Run like hell through a zombie mob that's headed your way, while being pursued by a murderous group of highly trained soldiers who have most likely killed more people than you've ever met. He let out a humorless laugh. See? Easy. Just two shots and run through a gauntlet that would kill most mortals. But hey, look at the bright side. If you do survive, you won't have to cook up some far-fetched story when you tell it to others, because they aren't going to believe the real story anyway. Easy. Easy. He chewed his lip for a beat. Just two shots, he repeated. Just two shots. He took a deep, shuddering breath, trying some deep breathing exercises to try to make himself calm down. Finally, he managed to slow his heart rate and stop fidgeting, stamping down the panic. He almost had himself completely calm and zen, before some of the zombies that were shambling away from him fell in front of his eyes, cut down by bullets. Max did his best to focus, but at best he was at 60% as his anxiety ramped up from the sight. He was trembling, knowing this wasn't like raiding the town when everybody was distracted. It was one thing to sneak around in the shadows when nobody knew you were there. This was another thing entirely, drawing all the attention his way. If you don't do this, Julius is dead, he declared to himself. So just do it already. He looked through the scope, spotting several muzzle flashes in the distance. A few seconds later, a few of the soldiers emerged from beside some houses. Two of them broke off and kicked in the door of one of the house to sweep it while the others continued the perimeter, firing off some rounds towards oncoming ghouls. Max focused in on the soldier in the middle of the group, a few steps ahead of the others. He squeezed the trigger, sending a round towards him. He missed, but could see through the scope that the soldiers immediately took a knee, getting low while they looked for the source of the shot. He lined up a second shot, squeezing the trigger, only this time his aim was spot on. The rifle round caught the soldier in the chest, knocking him to the ground. The vest stopped the bullet, but Max could see he was writhing on the ground in pain. He didn't get to admire his handiwork too long before bullets began firing towards the house. The window he was shooting from shattered as the soldiers sent a barrage of lead towards him. That got their attention, he gushed to himself and scrambled to his feet while staying low, quickly running out of the room. He sprinted back through the house the way he'd come, pulling himself through the window and down to the ground. As soon as he landed, he was greeted by a zombie. Rather than fight, he just shoved it as hard as he could, which was enough to force it to the ground. He ran over to the edge of the house, quickly taking aim at the soldiers coming his way and firing. He missed badly, but it did the job he needed it to, which was to keep their attention on him. The deserters immediately trained their fire on him, hitting the side of the house as he retreated, the zombie he knocked down slowly getting back up. He paused, helping it up and shoving it towards the edge of the house, hoping it would provide a bit of a surprise for the men coming after him. He didn't stick around long enough to find out, rather sprinting as hard as he could down the yards, jumping fences and trying to put distance between him and the kill squad. Max made it a couple of houses down before shots went off behind him. He didn't get hit, but he could hear the bullets whizzing by his head. This forced him to take drastic measures, running towards the back patio glass door of the house he was closest to. He dropped the rifle he was using as it was slowing him down, drawing his handgun and firing a couple of times towards the glass while sprinting towards it. He leapt through it, shattering it and cutting up his flesh in the process. Unfortunately for him, the dining room table was right there as well, so he slammed into it going full speed, sending him through the wood and crashing to the floor. As he pulled himself up, moans echoed from the living room. Really? He groaned and hauled himself up, running towards the front door. There was a zombie near it, but it was open and only the storm door was closed. 
Max rushed it, lowering his shoulder and busting through. As soon as the creature crashed through, gunfire erupts, ripping it to shreds. Strangely, the gunfire stopped right after it dropped. Did they think that was me? He wondered as he took off running down the side of the house. God, I hope so. When he reached the bedroom, he quickly threw open the window and dove out, feet first. As soon as he hit the dirt, footsteps echoed inside. Is he down? Someone barked, the fury evident in his tone. Is he down? No, it's one of those things, another one called back. Find him, the other soldier bellowed. Max took off running like a shot, moving to the back of the houses again, but this time staying close to the buildings, hoping the extra darkness covered his escape. He managed to get a block up undetected. He ducked inside a house, only this time without the added daredevil stunt work. When he got inside, he secured the door behind him, listening hard for zombies but hearing none. He crept soundlessly to the front of the house, breaths coming hard, and looked out, spotting the two-story house with the yellow shutters just a few doors down. Almost home free, he huffed quietly to himself. Just gotta get to the truck. He couldn't help the relief that the soldiers weren't following him, but he wasn't so naive as to also not feel concerned about it as well. What are you boys up to? he thought. Why aren't you taking shots at me? Much to his dismay, he got his answer. An engine roared in the distance and he positioned himself so he could look down the street. One of the SUVs they had come to town in drove down the road, with a gunner sticking out of the sunroof. Just had to ask, didn't I? He muttered under his breath. As the SUV patrolled, a handful of soldiers trotted behind it on foot. As they approached a house, one man broke away from the line to do a quick check of the house before rejoining the line. They were gone for several moments before kicking in the door and running through a house. The convoy was half a block away, and he knew he had to figure out fast what he was going to do. Run now, or hide, he thought frantically. Gotta decide quick. He looked at the gunman on top of the SUV, who was going to be his biggest threat. While he was looking forward, his gun was in a resting position. I'm fast enough, Max thought, hopping from foot to foot and trying to psych himself up. I'm fast enough. It's dark, a long shot, and it'll surprise him. You can make it. Just man up and do it. He took several quick breaths and then moved. He threw open the door and took off. He pumped his legs hard enough that he could feel the muscles burning, but didn't stop. He made it to the road, running right past a few zombies who were just as shocked as the lookout that Max was there. Rather than look back, he kept his eyes forward, even when shots began going off in the distance. As he made it to the yard, the engine roared, and multiple men yelled before gunshots popped off. Max made it to the side of the house, just as the headlights from the SUV pointed in his direction, and glanced back just to see the vehicle going off-road about twenty yards from his position. Grass from the front yard kicked up, and the driver fishtailed a bit as the gunman on top continued to fire. The little bit of control loss was the only thing that kept Max alive, as bullets hit the side of the house as he went around the corner. He ran as hard as he could, knowing he only had a couple of seconds before they were going to be onto him. As he got closer to the back corner of the house, the SUV smacked into the side of the neighboring house with a loud crunch, coming to a violent stop. Max knew he wasn't going to make it before the sunroof shooter was able to get him in his sights, so he took a chance. He stopped abruptly, turning and hastily aiming his gun towards him and opening fire. He shot every last bullet in the handgun while backing up. While his aim was nowhere close to perfect, it was enough to force the shooter to duck back down into the SUV for a brief moment. He turned and took off running, making sure to get behind the next house as he went, providing him just a bit of cover as he headed to the back fence. There were a few zombies in the yard that began shambling in his direction. He just sidestepped them, hoping that they could provide just another bit of cover to him as he approached the chain-link fence. Max's legs were rubber at this point, going well past the point of exhaustion from all the running and fighting. 
but he summoned enough strength to hop over the fence, stumbling a bit as the gunfire from behind him kicked up again. He spotted the truck, about forty yards away. As he ran, he was aided by the clouds, which covered him in darkness as he got to it. This didn't stop the bullets from flying in his direction, nor did it stop the SUV from ripping through the fence in pursuit of him. Max managed to get to the truck before the SUV could get within good firing range. The keys were already in the ignition, ready to go. He fired it up and slammed on the gas, lurching forward as bullets began to hit the back of the vehicle. The tires bounced on the uneven ground of the field, with the SUV behind him bopping all over the place too. This forced the shooter back into the cab, but the pursuit continued. After a couple of minutes, Max managed to get back on the road, speeding along it while getting his bearings. It took another few moments before the SUV pursuing him got on the road as well. Even as he hit speeds over a hundred miles per hour, the SUV behind him was not only keeping pace, but slowly closing the gap. Okay, time to see how lucky you really are, Max, he said to himself, speeding along the road for several miles, while staying far enough ahead that the vehicle behind him couldn't get a clean shot. He took a couple of turns onto side roads, weaving in between the main thoroughfares. The SUV didn't break pursuit. He made it up the road more, struggling to make one of the turns and going off-road a bit, which slowed him down. This allowed the SUV to catch up even more. A few shots went off, hitting the back window of the vehicle. Max got back onto the road and started speeding again when he spotted a familiar farm in the distance. When he read the giant metal sign over the entrance, a smile broke out on his face. There you are, he drawled as he gripped the steering wheel tightly. Now just have to hope I'm not too late. He cut the wheel of the truck hard, screeching the tires as he made it into the driveway. A cloud of dust kicked up as he screamed down it towards the large two-story farmhouse in the distance, a good half mile or so off the road. Max looked in the rearview mirror, seeing the headlights of the SUV making the turn as well. As he got closer to the house, he laid on the horn, which he then followed up with the same headlight code they used to get into their town. He repeated this until he got up to the house, slamming on the brakes just in front. He leapt out and took cover behind the wheel wells, holding his handgun for effect, even though there were no bullets left in it. The SUV stopped about ten yards away from it, the one soldier getting out of the passenger side, using the door for some cover as he aimed through the open window. Come out now, or we open fire! The soldier screamed. Sorry, I don't speak English, Max called, sarcasm evident in his tone. The soldier apparently wasn't amused and sent a few shots into the truck, shattering the window. Okay, okay, Max cried. Maybe I speak a little English. Come out now or you're dead, the soldier yelled. Max didn't get a chance to respond before several rifle shots went off from the second floor of the house. The two soldiers fell in a hurry, neither one of them knowing what hit them. Max popped up from behind the truck, looking down at the dead soldiers. He looked up, spotting his hunters leaning out the second floor window. You good down there? One of them called. Max breathed a heavy sigh of relief and held up a hand with a thumbs up. Yeah, I'm good, he called back. Never been so thankful in my life that you guys decided to take a break after refueling. The hunter shook his head. We didn't want to get too far away from you in case you needed a hand, he explained. Anybody else coming for you? I think this is it, Max replied, staring off down the road. Where are the others? the hunter asked. Still trapped in Loomis, Max explained. The hunter nodded. I'll get my stuff, he said. No, we've done our part, Max said, holding up a hand. Going back would just endanger them. He lowered his voice, murmuring to himself, We've done our part. The hunter nodded and disappeared back into the house. Max emerged from behind the truck, cautiously walking over to the soldiers and confirming their demise. He stood over them, shaking his head as he struggled to calm his racing heart. He thought of Atticus and Madison, and gazed off back towards town, murmuring, You two better make it out alive. The End